Welcome to a brand new episode of the Jam Pack Report today for February the 10th of 2020. Of course, my name is Samuel Adams and this is a daily gaming news podcast meant to bring you the hottest news from around the industry. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, hosted on YouTube and podcast services around the world. So if you enjoy the show, you like what you see, be sure to hit that subscribe button and keep coming back for more. But today for fans of Bioware, I've got some very big news for you in regards to Anthem. Unfortunately, no new drama. Dragon Age or Mass Effect news, oh no, we're still sticking by Anthem, through and through. Then on top of that, we'll be talking more about Resident Evil's Netflix series, System Shock 3 development hitting a bit of turbulence, Sony and how much they spent on Insomnia Games last year, and finally for fans of Modern Warfare, you might want to pay attention this week because Season 2 looks to be bringing a pretty big chunk of content into the game if you might be looking for a reason to go back into the Call of Duty fray. But without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into today's top gaming news. First and foremost, of course, if you scroll up on Polygon, Bioware is officially redesigning Anthem, and now we have the blog post to tell you about it. This is coming to us from the Bioware team. One year ago, we were preparing to launch Anthem, a game that represented a big leap into new territory for us as a studio. It was an exhilarating and terrifying experience to go out into the world with something new and different, and we are grateful to all of the players who have come along with us on the journey. It has been a thrill for us to see the creativity of our players in designing customized javelins and watching them master Anthem's flying and fighting gameplay. I am so proud of the work the team has put into the game, and at the same time, there is so much more that we and you would have wanted from it. Over the last year, the team has worked hard to improve stability, performance, and general quality of life while delivering three seasons of new content and features. We have also heard your feedback that Anthem needs a more satisfying loot experience, better long-term progression, and a more fulfilling end game. So we recognize that there is still more fundamental work to be done to bring out the full potential of the experience, and it will require a more substantial renovation than an update or expansion. Excuse me, reinvention, renovation, these are all synonymous, but they say reinvention, then an update or an expansion. Over the coming months, we will be focusing on a longer term redesign of the experience, specifically working to reinvent the core gameplay loop with clear goals, motivating challenges, and a progression with more meaningful rewards, while preserving the fun of flying and fighting in a vast science fantasy setting. And to do that properly, we will be doing something we would like to have done more the first time around, giving a focused team the time to test and iterate, focusing on gameplay first. In the meantime, we will continue to run the current version of Anthem, but move away from full seasons as the team works towards the future of Anthem. We will keep the game going with events, store refreshes, and revisiting past seasonal and cataclysm content, starting with our anniversary towards the end of the month. Creating new worlds is central to our studio mission, but it's not easy. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we miss. What keeps us going is the support from players like you. Your feedback gives us guidance on how we can improve, and your passion inspires us with the courage to create. I look forward to working together with your involvement and feedback towards the best possible future for Anthem. Signed, Casey from Bioware. Now, this is an interesting story in and of itself because of the fact uh, that a couple of months back, we got a report from Kotaku that said, hey, guess what? Anthem's not dead. Bioware is still continuing to reinvent the game itself, and they are going to completely rebuild it from the ground up and redesign it into the game that they wanted it to be. And that was exciting, but this is a little bit more exciting because now we know they are acknowledging that the final product was something that didn't really have vision. That's what I'm reading in this. Uh, I think that was the main problem with Anthem. And of course, if you've been paying attention to my take on this entire situation for the past couple of months, you'll know that I look at Anthem and I see a lot of Destiny 2 in this situation with Anthem because Destiny 2 launched and it was good but it wasn't what fans expected. It wasn't what original Destiny players wanted from the sequel to the game. And over the months after release, you began to see improvements here and there. Then you saw a complete revamp, and with more DLC came a better experience. And now Destiny 2 is back on top as one of the biggest games in the world, with many people already looking forward to what's coming with the future of Destiny. Now, with Anthem, they had a bit of an uphill battle because they had to establish a world to begin with. And from what we saw from reports about the development of the game, there really was no drive. There was no vision. They created a game for the main reason of having a game. You know, with Bungie and Destiny, there was a story to tell, and there is still a story to tell. And there is an entire world full of lore. With Anthem, you've got the lore, and there's a sort of 
thrown together story to tell, but ultimately there was something lacking in it. It just didn't have the soul. And so if you give the team time to design a gameplay experience that is number one, substantial, number two, satisfactory, but number three, engaging and deep, then you actually have potential here because the game itself looks beautiful, especially if they have improved how it runs. Uh, but I'm excited to see what happens with Anthem. And my question is, will it remain exclusive to the PS4, the Xbox One, and the PC, or will it continue on over into the next generation with the PS5 and the Xbox Series X? Uh, because if they are going to be optimizing for the next gen of consoles, this could be one of the first big uh, looter shooter kind of grindy games on the next generation. It has the potential uh, to pull somewhat of a Warframe, you know, because Warframe came out towards the beginning of the PlayStation 4 life cycle. I believe it was available as a free to play game on day one or it was one of the first PlayStation Plus games or something along those lines, and it began to really gain a lot of traction. And that's part of the reason why Warframe is as successful today as it actually is. So Bioware could very well do that with the future of Anthem, but I suppose we have to wait and see exactly how that pans out. However, another thing we'll have to wait and see about is Resident Evil's Netflix series, but we now know exactly what it is going to be entailing. It appears a Resident Evil Netflix show may indeed be in the works. A Resident Evil Netflix show is in development apparently as news of it comes from Netflix's media center. The description was removed, but not before Resident Evil database was able to secure a screen grab of the listing. Excuse me. To confirm the listing was accurate, Resident Evil Wiki used Wayback Machine, and sure enough, the listing was indeed posted to Netflix's media center. Here is the description. The town of Clearfield... Maryland has a, I had to think about what's MD, not medical doctor. Uh, the town of Clearfield, Maryland has long stood in the shadow of three seemingly unrelated behemoths, the Umbrella Corporation, the decommissioned Greenwood Asylum, and Washington, D.C. Today, 26 years after the discovery of the T-virus, secrets held by the three will start to be revealed at the first signs of outbreak. Back in January 2019, Deadline reported Netflix was developing a Resident Evil series loosely based on the video game, and Constantine Film will be the studio behind it. Whether this was still the case or not remains to be seen, as no further info was provided in the listing, but the German production company was behind the Resident Evil movies starring Mila Jovovich. I believe that's how you say that name. Until confirmed, no matter how accurate this appears, keep this filed away as an unconfirmed report, but I do believe this is going to be exactly what we are going to be getting. So that sounds pretty neat. Uh, now, if this is live action, which I would assume it is, then I'm pretty excited about this because Resident Evil is due for a good piece of non-gaming content. It's due for a good movie, a TV show, maybe even a comic book or two. Just give me something good because this universe is absolutely overflowing uh, with potential. Very excited to see what Netflix does with this uh, because they've been on a roll as of late, especially when you look at stuff like The Witcher. That was very good. Additionally, in the anime animated realm. The Castlevania series, very good top-notch stuff. Netflix is getting very good at what they do, and for good reason, because it's making them a ton of money, uh, which is exactly what would happen if there was indeed a good Resident Evil show. Now, personally, I'm looking forward to my Guitar Hero TV show adaptation, but that's just me. I'm just saying. Uh, so we will have to give it a while. I'm sure this is still a good ways off, but hopefully we'll get some kind of trailer, maybe a reveal or two, some official info coming soon. However, bad news coming down the pipe. The whole System Shock 3 team might have been let go. Development on System Shock 3 is on red alert following reports that no one is working on the game anymore. After high-profile people left developer Other Side Inter Entertainment, excuse me, including the writer-director, senior designer, lead programmer, QA lead, and senior environment artist, it seems as though the entire team may not work there anymore, effectively putting System Shock 3 on ice. These reports were aggregated by Video Game Chronicle across a few different forums. Sam Langcott, other Side's former community manager took to the studio's forums in December to confirm layoffs and to show concern for the state of the game and team. Langcott also directed people to post on the RPG Codex forums where the anonymous developer detailed the troubles with System Shock 3. This dev, who Langcott effectively vouched for, painted the picture of a project that is doomed to fail. Here is the full transcript of the post so as to provide all possible context. It looks bad. The only reason I'm posting is because I saw so much confusion about the state of the company and the project I thought some first person information would be welcome. I never suggested we were halfway done. Core systems are a great foundation for a game, but most of the work is content development, which we were critically behind in, both in real assets and in tool support for an efficient pipeline. Was the failure of the project right? It's hard to say. 
If Star Breeze had not gone into crisis, I think we would have delivered something interesting with some fresh and innovative gameplay, but a much smaller game than what people were expecting and inevitably disappointing for a sequel to such a beloved franchise. Those high expectations drove a lot of expensive experimentation. We were a small team and we knew we couldn't compete with the current immersive sims and production quality and breadth, so we had to be creative and clever and weird. We were on our way to make something unique and possibly fun, but probably not what the audience was hungry for. And that's the end of the post itself. Starbreeze was System Shock 3's publisher before being forced to sell the rights due to severe financial troubles, leading the way both creatively and financially. It seems as both other side never quite figured out what it wanted from System Shock 3 to be. I'm sorry, leading the way both creatively and financially. There we go. Weird way to say that. It seems as though other side never quite figured out what it wanted System Shock 3 to be. I promise I can read. It could not be as big and polished as something like Prey, but that's what System Shock fans expected. Now it sounds like no one is around anymore. Probably a combination of layoffs and frustrated leads just giving up, and the game has been ostensibly abandoned. Bad news here, a lot of people were excited about this game, but as time goes on, some franchises just fade, they fall away. That's the nature of the beast, that's kind of what people expect, and unfortunately, it looks like System Shock 3 was cannibalized by the fact that, hey, some games just never see the light of day. Uh, so as for right now, that's where the game stands, but I wanted to report on this because it seemed like it was somewhat of a, a big deal uh, for a lot of people who were looking forward to playing the sequel to a very, very beloved franchise. However, speaking of good sequels that I cannot wait to play, looking forward to the next Spider-Man game from Insomniac, or whatever they end up putting out, but Sony spent $229 million last year to acquire Insomniac itself. In a filing made to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, Sony revealed how much it spent to acquire Insomniac Games last year. The mostly cash deal cost the PlayStation brand $229 million, a hefty price tag to bring in the longtime collaborator. However, after Marvel's Spider-Man sold 13.2 million units last year, it's a move that makes sense. Sony announced the deal last August, a year after the aforementioned Spider-Man game blew up on PS4. We still don't yet know what Insomniac is working on next. However, it would stand to reason that it will be something for Sony's upcoming PS5 console. We have seen demos showing off speedy load times for Spider-Man on PS5-like hardware, and thus it might make sense for a sequel to that game being their next title. Regardless, it is certainly worth watching the developer as we move closer to the PlayStation 5's launch. Insomnia Games was founded in 1994 and only released Sony games for its first 18 years. They created franchises like Spire the Dragon, Ratchet & Clank, and Resistance. However, they slowly started to branch out in 2012, even releasing the Xbox One exclusive Sunset Overdrive in 2014. Now they are officially back with Sony, which is great news for a console manufacturer about to launch a brand new unit. Hopefully in the coming weeks or months, we will get some information about the PS5 and Insomniac's next game. Whether it is a follow-up to their Spider-Man game, a refresh of an old IP, or something brand new, Insomniac is always a studio worth paying attention to. And indeed they are. I've always loved Insomniac and I've always loved Spider-Man. And their game really did bring something unique to the table. I'm very impressed uh, with what I've seen. Also, side note, DualShockers chose to go with the Sam Raimi uh, Spider-Man costume. Good choice. That's the real Spider-Man. But $229 million, that's the big figure here. And is Insomniac worth it? Without a doubt, 100%. Now, the big thing here is what are they going to be working on next? Of course, a sequel to Spider-Man kind of makes sense, uh, but I've also seen rumors that a port of Sunset Overdrive could be coming to the PlayStation 5 or even the PlayStation 4. Uh, in addition to this, will we be seeing a sequel to Sunset Overdrive or even something else entirely? Uh, that is something that is yet to be seen, but I'm excited to see where it goes. And of course, with this kind of price, on the company itself, I'm sure Sony is excited to see what the company itself is working on, too, uh, because, man, it'd be nice to know. Of course, Sony, PlayStation, already knows what Insomniac is doing, needless to say. But I can't wait to actually get the full reveal. It's a big blow to Xbox One as well, because Sunset Overdrive was one of the biggest exclusives of the generation, in my humble opinion. Uh, and so with that potential being gone for an exclusive sequel, that's just crumbling, uh, crushing, whatever you want to call it. Choose a negative adjective and put it into the Mad Lip, if you will. Uh, but regardless, Insomniac killing it right now, and Sony paying for it dearly with $229 million. However, to round out today's show, starting in just a couple of hours, fan-favorite Rust Map is back for Modern Warfare Season 2. 
New maps and fan favorites are coming to Call of Duty Modern Warfare Season 2 beginning on February the 11th. Activision and Infinity Ward have finally announced the roadmap that details the flow of content from day one until the coming weeks. Just like Modern Warfare's inaugural Season 1, this will be a steady release of content over the span of several weeks, and a specific end date is unknown at this time. All maps and new weapons will still be free for everyone. Not everyone is going to be a fan of the gradual flow of content. However, the roadmap does show that a fair amount will be available to enjoy day one, including four additional maps. Modern Warfare 2's iconic Rust map has been remastered for both the 2v2 gunfight and standard multiplayer modes. Atlas Superstore is a brand new multiplayer map that allows players to mop up their enemies in the aisles of a gigantic big box store. I love fighting in like stores and stuff. Oh my gosh. I am here for it. Uh, then Bazaar is another new small map exclusive to Gunfight, and Zakav Boneyard is a large-scale airplane junkyard tailored for the 32v32 ground war. One of the biggest additions to Season 2 is the highly requested CDL playlist, which will allow players to queue up for the pros, like in Call of Duty League. This playlist will include the maps, modes, and rule sets found in the game's official competitive esports organization, and it's unclear if this will have any type of ranking system similar to what we've seen in the past with competitive playlist, but this at least gives players a pro league style challenge. There will be two new weapons, the Growl 556 Assault Rifle and Striker 45 Submachine Gun. Fan favorite character Simon Ghost Riley from 09's Modern Warfare 2 will be available as an operator, although he is not quite the familiar face people will be expecting, as the new Modern Warfare's version of Ghost definitely sports a different skull mask from the original. With the season's launch, not sure what I said there. Players can also expect a brand new battle pass with free and premium streams of cosmetics. The premium pass will cost 1,000 COD points or about 10 bucks, but the rewards are purely cosmetic and don't affect gameplay in any way. The roadmap does not tell us everything that is to come beyond launch day, but players can expect new maps, new multiplayer modes, gunfight variants, and at least one more new weapon. Season 1 did a great job of rotating various game modes, and I hope Season 2 will continue to keep the playlist fresh, says the author over at Katana. Taku, S.E. Doster. I love Modern Warfare. Uh, so I recently rebought the game on Xbox because I've been spending more time on the Xbox than the PlayStation. I know, sinful, but I love my Xbox. I've been really enjoying it. And so I'm diving back into Season 2 with a new account because Activision accounts are just a pain in the ass to merge together. So I'm like, hey, let's start over. Why not? Who loves the grind? I love the grind. Uh, so season two going to be on Xbox, really enjoying this. And I love to see the fan favorites make a comeback because man, the amount of times in middle school and high school uh, that I went to town on some Modern Warfare 2, I went 1v1 with people from my class on Rust. Oh, it just brings back so many phenomenal memories. So I cannot wait to get into this tomorrow. But if you do want to dive into season two, then you should stay tuned for Season 2 tomorrow on Modern Warfare when it launches as soon as the servers update, which generally happens sometime in the middle of the morning, if I remember correctly. But hey, you can always stay tuned to the official Call of Duty account on Twitter for all the most up-to-date and recent information. But that rounds out today's episode of the Jam Pack Report. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to drop me a like down below if you are watching on YouTube. Or, of course, if you're listening on a podcast service, subscribe to the show and keep yourself in the know. But until tomorrow, you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. I'll talk to you soon, and peace.